Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. If you're interested in learning about the ketogenic diet like I was to save my own life, then this is probably the podcast for you. Eight years ago, I knew nothing about it. Six years ago, it saved my life. Three years ago, I started researching and talking with some of the authorities in the field and attending medical conferences about this to understand why and how keto so dramatically changed my and my wife's Judy's lives. The purpose of this podcast is to share our journey of discoveries with you in understanding how keto is so effective in improving so many different conditions, from obesity, epilepsy, diabetes, infertility, MS, Alzheimer's, heart disease, to name a few. So take a step away from all the hype you've probably heard and roll up your sleeves with me and join me weekly to explore this living miracle that anyone can access. We'll talk science. We'll talk food. We'll explore its history and evolution to today, which is that the sheer wonder of the ketogenic way of eating has changed untold number of lives, unlike anything before it. And in case I forget to mention it, please join our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp, and welcome back to another episode of the Keto Naturopath. I'd like to begin a series of podcasts that are about epigenetics. And I hope through this series, which may be about four long, maybe a little longer, four different podcasts, that is, that you see, you understand what epigenetics it is, you see its relevance to your specific situation, and you most likely will certainly pick up your relevance to any children you have and then their children, and understanding how important nutrition is at key times of one's life. So let's start with so this is epigenetics. This is obviously going to be an application of keto. You'll see it coming intermittently, but I'm going to have to talk on epigenetics so you understand this concept so we can then just move on and referencing this afterwards. Just like we can reference keto now, I don't have to go and retell you all about what the ketogenic diet is. We've done that in many, many episodes and its applications and changes it makes in people's lives. Okay, so what is epigenetics? Before I actually give you a formal definition of that, which of course you can find on Google or online yourself, I'm going to explain how we got to identifying that it is a thing, that it is different than regular biology, though it'll probably soon just be included in what is considered biology. And it's no longer considered part of your, what your DNA. So how did we come to thinking about this? So let me take you back to one of three key events. And I think three key events in my view of what has really created a pretty solid understanding of what epigenetics is, are three things. And I'll do it in chronological order, which is usually not how things happen. It's usually the most recent, and you go back and find out how these events were. So chronological order, the oldest is the Dutch famine of 1944, which is called the hunger winter for the Dutch about before they were liberated, before the western part of Holland was liberated. And then after that, we're going to talk about the Overcalix study. And then last, we're going to talk about Dr. Jurdy's work at Duke around 2002 and later in 2010. And we'll talk about a, another study in 2006 because in the world in which I've come to know, which is medicine and health, and I'm a naturopath, so you, if you want to call that alternative medicine, we still do a lot of labs, as anybody who knows me will agree. The explosion and understanding and application of this thing called epigenetics started really around 2003, 2002, 2003. And I'll give you even current references, not just to that word, but to some of these, all the things that I've just mentioned are still being re-examined. So the Dutch, the documents of the Dutch famine of 44 to 45 are still being re-examined. The Overcalix study and the person who put that together, Dr. Lars Olav Virgrind of uh, Sweden, he's still writing. And his work back then is still being reviewed and diced apart and what else conclusions in there. And Dr. Jurdy's work, which is 2002, 2006, really was the crown on all this by saying, this is immediately applicable to a lot of people's lives. There's something we can do to change it for the better. Okay, then. We're starting back in November of 1944, and I'm going to do some reading for this. I'm not going to pretend that I have all this memorized other than I can talk about this. So 
the Dutch famine of 44 to 45, known in the Netherlands as a hunger winter, hunger winter, was a famine that took place in the German-occupied Netherlands, especially in the densely populated western provinces north of the Great Rivers during the winter of 44 to 45. The German blockade cut off food and shipments from farm towns. Some four and a half million were affected and survived thanks to soup kitchens, and an estimated 30,000 deaths occurred due to the famine. The famine was about six months long. So what had happened, little backstory here, is that obviously World War II is going on, and the formal government of the Netherlands were in exile in the UK. A lot of governments were in exile in the UK. And they had been encouraging a strike by the railroad workers just to shut down the railroad so the Germans wouldn't be able to move their things around, the armaments and so on and so forth. And that's a great idea. However, it also contributed to immediately not being able to get the harvest out. So this harvest was happening, and this is back before refrigeration and so on, for the most part, that so consequently the harvest could not be shipped to serve themselves. And this was a very specific area. So the, the strike shut down the Germans. The Germans retaliated by saying, fine, we will now do a formal blockade. Ordinarily, they would let humanitarian food or humanitarian reasons or intentions would be allowed to get through. But they said, fine, it's a blockade. Nothing's getting through. So that began the beginning of this famine. And so they were unprepared, you know, expecting the harvest. You know, they don't have years of things stored. And so they're not getting that. And then it became one of the worst records, the worst winters on record. So consequently, the ports are freezing up on the coast. And so the ships couldn't come in, even as smugglers couldn't come in. It was just uh, completely locked up. So it got exacerbated very quickly. Now to continue reading. The famine was alleviated by the liberation of the provinces by the Allies in 1945. Prior to that, baked bread from flour shipped in from Sweden that did make it through the lines and the airlift food uh, by the Brits and by the, the U.S. did make it through only under an agreement with the Germans at a particular time, very late in the famine, and they're called mercy flights. And so the Germans said, you know, we won't bomb you and we'll let you go through, we won't shoot you down and if you don't bomb us. And that's how that worked out. So an interesting aside here is that, so they're starving and they're getting a lot of wheat from Sweden. Sweden was a big wheat basket for Scandinavia. So they were starving for a while and then they got the wheat. And what they found is that before all the deaths started is that those that were suffering from a Crohn's disease, it all was alleviated. It was all alleviated. So they all got better. This is why they were starving. But their Crohn's disease all got better. So then the bread was the first thing and really the only thing that they had to eat for a while was coming in from Sweden, you know, and, and drops and easy thing to drop over lines. And so then they started making bread again and all those people that had Crohn's disease came back. And as an aside, this is one of the definitive events of, of mass experiment, if you will, to define and articulate what exactly Crohn's was, was a reaction to the wheat, to the gluten in the wheat. And so this is at a time in which way before pesticides and fungicides and, and preservatives and all these other uh, chemicals that are put on wheat. So well before that whole era of industrial food began. So it's a clean example of gluten is very much a causative agent of Crohn's. So that was an aside became confirmed because of this particular situation. And a doctor in Holland, maybe I'll get to it later, is the one that sort of wrote this up and really identified the causative agent being gluten. Okay then, towards the end of World War II, food supplies became increasingly scarce in the Netherlands after the landing of the Allied forces on D-Day. Conditions became increasingly bad in Nazi-occupied Netherlands. The Allies were able to liberate the southern part of the country but ceased their advance into the Netherlands when Operation Market Garden was stopped because of the, the war. The Allies' advance to Germany was delayed by supply problems as the port of Antwerp was not usable until the approaches had been cleared, etc., etc. So the food stocks in the city in Western Netherlands rapidly ran out. Adult rations in the cities dropped below 1,000 calories a day by the end of November of 44. 
into 580 calories in the West, which is the area of the center of the blockade, by the end of February. So by the end of February, the population as an average was having 580 calories. So that means some were having more and some were having less. Over this hunger winter, a number of factors contributed to cause starvation in especially the large cities. In the winter in the months of January 1945 itself was unusually harsh, prohibiting further transportation. So approximately 30,000 people died and about 40,000 babies were born. And looking back and why this particular episode in history has become such a big deal is because it's the, really the last time in modern history, quote unquote, modern history in which there was a population who were previously healthy, then starved. And then, you know, what were the repercussions of that? Because they could be compared to a population in the same country, just a little ways away on the other side of the blockade, and certainly compared to other countries and certainly compared to what they knew of human statistics in general. So what they found was starting to begin this thinking that what happens to the mother who, A, is about to get pregnant, that conceives, and two, mothers that were pregnant, and what happened to their children, so those who were in utero, and those that were born just after, and those are the, the mothers themselves. And so they have a lot of data and they go back to this cache of data and tease out more and more differentials of what has happened and they're still following the population. So what they got to do is to see how many births there were and then keep track of these births. And then when these babies became mature individuals and had their children, which was really in the 60s, the mid 60s, that they got to see what happened for the second generation. And then even into the late 80s and early 90s, into the third generation to find out what happened that their great-grandmother, what what traits were carried forward due to their great-grandmothers having to experience the famine in Holland in 44 to 45, or their grandmother, or their mother. So three generations of looking at effects that were carried down from their mother. And you could say their father too. Most of it was about the mother at this particular situation. Of the women and their pregnancies. So here's some of the things that they had found. So the legacy of this famine from 44 to 45, November to May, until they were liberated in Holland, uh, was such a rare case of famine which took place in modern developed literate country, albeit one suffering from the privations of occupation of war, the well-documented experience has helped scientists to measure the effects of famine on human health. So it became what they call the Dutch Famine Birth Cohort Study. Found the children of pregnant women exposed to famine were mostly susceptible to diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, microalbuminuria, which is uh, not enough protein in the blood. Moreover, children of the women who were pregnant during the famine were smaller as expected. However, surprising when these children grew up and had children, their children are also thought to be smaller than average. The data suggests that the famine experienced by the mothers caused some kind of epigenetic changes that were passed down to the next generation. Despite this, a subsequent study by the same researchers failed to find the conclusion being black or white. The discovery of the cause of celiac disease, which I've mentioned, may also be partly attributed to the Dutch famine. With wheat, in very short supply, there was an improvement in the children's ward of celiacs patients. Stories tell of the first precious supplies of bread being given specifically to the no longer sick children, prompting an immediate relapse. Thus, in the 1940s, the Dutch pediatrician William Dick was also able to corroborate his previous research hypothesis that the wheat intake was aggravating the celiac disease. He later went on to confirm this, and this was his, he became identified with the definer and researcher of celiac disease. So in the 1960s, researchers began to study these now full-grown famine survivors, and the results were shocking. All had the usual complications, in particular those fetuses who were in the last trimester, 
during the height of the famine, so the last trimester is the last three months of pregnancy, during the height of the famine, had very low birth weights. They did grow up normal, but later suffered from very high rates of diabetes. On the other hand, babies who were in the first six months of gestation during the height of the famine were normal weight at birth, but when they reached adulthood, went on to give birth to unusually small babies. Those fetuses exposed to famine during pregnancy, during gestation, also went on to develop more COPD, obstructive pulmonary disease, and kidney diseases. Your kidney or your lungs go together, by the way. Think of COVID and the ACE2 receptor, angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Those whose mothers starved at the beginning of the pregnancy gestation have more atherosclerosis, that's cardiovascular disease, altered blood clotting, hyperinflammation, more obesity, and here's a kicker, three high, threefold increase in cardiovascular disease. Daughters of the mothers pregnant during the famine. So daughters, the kids, the little girls were born after the famine was over, but they were pregnant, they were in utero during the famine, were significantly more diabetic and obese at midlife on average, and men had higher rates of schizophrenia and an exaggerated response to stress. This is one of the first ones that I saw a tease out that men had the higher rate of schizophrenia. Other things that I've read that it was a 300% increase in schizophrenia. So that's really noteworthy. We're going to get to that in subsequent podcasts when we get into methylation and how famine and stress affects methylation. And that's one of the things you'll be able to work with. Okay, so there we go. We had schizophrenia and exaggerated response to stress. So think of cortisol. Think of a a hair trigger response to stress. You're just very agitated and very nervous most of the time. Hypervigilant would be the word. What had happened to produce these dramatic effects, and even more significantly, how did someone go on, did some of these go on to become inheritable in the case of those women who were babies in the first trimester of the hunger winter, and impart small size to their offspring decades after the famine. In any case, the evidence seems to be building that you're not what you eat, but you're more likely what your grandmother did not eat, in this case, famine. In case you think that this is interesting, it's World War II history and uh, a little science thrown in, I'm reading from the New York Times now in 2018, the article's called The Famine Ended 70 Years Ago, Dutch Genes Still Bear Scars. And it shows some uncomfortable pictures to look at from the starvation of 44 to 45. But it talks about what had happened and, you know, quickly brings you through the horrible situation. But here we go. Because the Dutch hunger winter has proved unique in unexpected ways because it started and ended so abruptly. It has served as an unplanned experiment in human health. Pregnant women, it turns out, were uniquely vulnerable, and the children they gave birth to have been influenced by famine throughout their lives. When they became adults, they ended up a few pounds heavier than average. In middle age, they had higher rates of triglycerides and LDL. For anybody who knows me, we know the labs, that rings a bell. They also experienced higher rates of conditions of obesity, diabetes, and schizophrenia. At the time they reached old age, those risks had taken a measurable toll. According to the research, in 2013, this researcher reviewed the death records in hundreds of thousands of Dutch people born in the mid-40s, and they found that people who had been in utero during the famine, known as the Dutch Hunger Winter Cohort Study, died at a higher rate than the people born before or after. We found 10% increase, so on. How on earth can your body remember an environment it was exposed to in the womb and remember it decades later? And this is the question that a number of people who have done looked at this data come away with. And one study suggested that the Dutch hunger winter silenced certain genes in unborn children and that it stayed quiet ever since. So what does that mean? So if you need genes to be expressed, that is to be accessed, some of them could be better able to access blood sugar and so on and so forth, you need that 
gene not to be silenced, but to be active, and then vice versa, of course, as we've mentioned before. While all cells in a person's body share the same genes, different ones are active or silent at different cells. The program largely is locked in place before birth. The scientists have learned that later experiences, say exposure to a virus, can cause cells to quiet a gene or boost its activity, sometimes permanently. The study of this long-term gene control is called epigenetics. Researchers have identified molecules that cells use to program DNA. But how those tools work isn't entirely clear. One of the best studies is a molecule cap called methyl group. Just go with it. If this sounds like we're getting into science, just go with it. We're going to come back with it. A million of spots across our DNA, genes carry a methyl group. This seems to silence genes. At least researchers have found that silence genes often have a collection of methyl groups lurking nearby. Many researchers have speculated that the prenatal conditions can influence people's health across their lifetime, and some have speculated that methyl groups or other forms of epigenetics puts this so-called fetal programming into action. But it's hard to put that idea to a firm test. The Dutch hunger winter might offer an opportunity. When these researchers first started studying the Dutch hunger winter cohort studies in the 1990s, he took blood samples from thousands of middle-aged subjects. He also took samples from their siblings born before or after the famine. Over a decade, he and his colleagues were able to take advantage of a powerful new technology for detecting methyl groups in the blood. They retrieved DNA from the samples and placed it in a device able to find methyl groups at nearly 350,000 spots on a genome. Next, the researchers looked for odd patterns. They searched for methyl groups that were in common, that were common in the Dutch hunger winter cohort, for example, but missing from their siblings. Then they turned their attention to the health of their subjects. They sorted out people into body mass index, that is how big, right, your BMI, for example, and looked for methyl groups that were usually common in overweight people. Finally, the researchers merged the results and found few methyl groups that were linked both to the famine and to health conditions later in life. We were able to connect the dots. Said Dr. Lumi, who's the guy looking into it, says Congress proposed that these methyl groups disrupt how cells normally use genes. One methyl group that is linked to a higher body mass may be able to quiet a gene called PIM3. Don't hold on to that information, which is involved in burning body's fuel. Now think for a second. If you're starving, you're going to slow down the various parts of your body that burn fuel. You're going to make it for obviously the essential functions of your life, but you're going to be very efficient burner because you've become fuel conservative. So this kind of makes sense in a survival way of looking at it. But going forward, and in other studies when they really sort of generalize these conclusions, what they say is when the survivors are the when those children that were born of mothers who were in the famine were smaller, et cetera, et cetera. So they were born with these things. And then they went into a non- famine situation for the rest of their life, a degree of affluence, we'll call it, where there was enough food around, they became very obese very quickly. So it's a little bit like, and I'm jumping off here, it's a little bit like going to the Pacific Islanders. Remember, the Pacific Islanders had their own way of life and the West came in, and so suddenly they had junk food and all this food they didn't have, and they quickly became diabetic very fast. And it's also indigenous Native American tribes on the Mexican border, the Puma Indians. Those in the United States, you know, so the genetically same stock, those in the United States became the most obese people in the United States, the most diabetic people in the United States, in Arizona and New Mexico, the Puma Indians, whereas their cousins or whatever, their relatives in the other side of the wall who still live in semi-poverty are in actually good health. Kind of ironic, huh? Okay, then. Jumping down, he said, and the Dutch famine probably led to many miscarriages and early deaths. It's possible that survivors had some genetic variant that made them resilient and gave them a distinctive epigenetic profile not captured in this study. So there you go. That That's the beginning of saying, hey, we're now looking at this particular unusual experiment because it happened when it happened. And the summary is, if scientists can solve the Dutch winter wintering lingering mysteries, 
They might also get some clues on how other kinds of stresses can reprogram children's health and even before they're born. So it's not just stress. It's not just sort of the PTSD aspect of this, but this is true as well. They have studies of post 9-11 and those who lived in that area that were pregnant and so on. So it's very similar. That's a little scattered and harder to do, but they do find that just that stress, a particular moment has its own effect in the same sort of way. This is more about hypocaloric uh, malnourishment throughout the pregnancy. To show you how current this work still is, you'll have studies that are in science journals and so on and so forth that are based upon this work. And one is about DNA methylation. So now you heard about methyl groups. DNA methylation as a mediator of association between prenatal adversity and risk of metabolic disease in adulthood. And let's read you the first line of the abstract. And this is 2018. Although it was assumed that epigenetic mechanisms such as changes in DNA methylation underlie the relationship between adverse intrauterine conditions, in other words, mother who's starving or had the PTSD, and adult metabolic health, evidence from human studies remains scarce. Clearly, it remains scarce. It just not isn't, there isn't a lot of labs that have people in it. You know, this is the last lab, so to say, of humans was this particular famine and doing it before and after and also concurrent, not far away of, of the same sort of genetic stock of people. So interesting. So what I want you to get out of this is about DNA methylation is affected in the mother, a preconception, during conception, and obviously during the pregnancy, interuterine aspect. We're going to go further with that when we get into the over calyx study, and we're going to look at it a little different way over a number of different there again, we're looking back in history about the documentation. You know, it's not about the biology, but they're saying who lived, who died, and being able to access subsequent generations of the people who had parents and grandparents that experienced, we're going to look at periods of abundance as well as famines and to see what the differences is in northern Sweden. So methylation, famine, and Google this if you'd like, which is basically the Dutch hunger winter 1944 to 45. And you'll see that it will come up both in PubMed and also various studies that just simply retell that story. As in essence, horrible as it is, it is an experiment that happened that we're learning a lot about still. Okay. So till next time, good talking with you. Bye-bye. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp. I just wanted to encourage you to send in your questions to Dr. Goldcamp at ketonaturopath.com. Many of you have, and so what I've done with these questions that I've gotten back to most of the people I email, but some of the questions that were so good, and if they're overlapping to other questions, I would combine them and try to put that into the topic of a podcast, either via one of the micro topics that are covered in an interview. As you know, we cover a lot of topics in a given interview or some of my own sort of reporting, if you will, on some of these issues. So please keep the questions coming. Feel free to send in an email and uh, I will get back to you. Stay listening, send in your questions, and I will definitely get back to you.